on theories applied to genocide. Um, one of the uh, perspectives that, that kind of combines the micro and macro, um, it's, it's really it's a systems approach where we begin to look at organizational factors and patterns and networks and um, basically viewing the perpetrator society as a system of interrelated parts where a change in one part leads to changes in others. And, and one of the models that, that really flows out of that tradition is the ecological model. And this model looks at the relationships between the individual family, community, and society, uh, analyzing what is referred to as um, microsystems, meso mesosystems, exosystems, and macrosystems. Uh, looking at the microsystems, uh, focusing on the everyday settings, for example, and then the mesosystems, uh, more of um, looking at the relationships uh, between the microsystems, for example, links between uh, the family and, and the school. And then the exosystem, looking at social groups that influence others, like policymakers, neighborhoods, uh, uh, community organizations. And then macrosystems that focus more on political, economic, and, and um, other large institutions and, and all the interactions between them. So this model may be useful in examining the different um, uh, groups and individuals and organizations within uh, a particular genocide. Uh, and I have not really seen this applied uh, that, that frequently in, 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 in genocide uh, research, but it's certainly um, you know, something uh, to consider. And also moving into the... Um, uh, the uh, systems approach really uh, is, is strain theory. And, and, and strain theory is based on the idea that if we have social conditions of, of um, confusion and ambiguity or what is referred to as normlessness where we're not sure of what the rules are, uh, we have increased stress and the greater likelihood of um, engaging in, in violent behavior in a community or society. Uh, and basically... Um, we're looking at this whole idea of, of, of strain and, and Linsky, Bachman and Strauss created the state stress index to measure economic, family and community stressors in each state. And um, then they wanted to see if the stress levels were related to um, measures of, of state level violence like homicide rates and suicide rates and rape rates. What they found was that the um, higher the stress in the in the state, the higher the violent crime rates, the higher levels of stress were also related to high rates of smoking and alcohol use, suicide, rape and homicide, and that high rates of violence are associated with high rates of legitimate violence such as capital and corporal punishment at the state level, and that family violence is related to high rates of alcohol consumption and legitimate violence. And, and so here they began to f begin to focus on some specific strains within the economic family and, and, and community uh, s settings, and um, they actually have 15 uh, stressors that make up, up, up the index. But the whole idea here is that stress and strain uh, can lead to uh, violent behavior and that uh, sometimes we see, in fact, many times we see that there's a lot of strain and stressors in a society preceding a genocide, and also we see genocides occurring uh, during wars, and, and so that may be a high-risk factor as well, the stresses and strains associated with wars and the nature of war leading uh, to possible genocides as, um, as, as well. And um, another model related is cultural spillover, and that is kind of uh, bringing in from uh, Strauss's work. Um, uh, Murray Strauss developed this idea uh, from using differential association theory, subculture theory, control theory, labeling theory, and social learning and personality theories, kind of bringing it all over and, um, and, 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 and coming up with the idea that violence spills over into other areas of, um, of, of social life. I, w I wondered about this. Uh, for a long time, and I went searching the literature, and then I found David Levinson's work. So moving into the anthropological um, research, uh, David Levinson used the human relations area file, an anthropological uh, huge data set, uh, to study violence in a sample of 90 preliterate and peasant societies. And he found that violence was absent or rare in 15 of the 90 societies. 
when he was looking at family violence. The whole um, idea here that got me um, interested in, in, in looking at this was, uh, you, you know, the question, are there any societies that don't have violence uh, or very uh, little violence? Is that a possibility? Or is violence just, you know, part of uh, all societies? And, and so uh, David Levinson's work clearly shows that, no, that it is possible, and there are societies that are not violent. And um, and then he he examined uh, their characteristics and he found some features related, to, for example, to spouses sharing in domestic decision making and economic equality between men and women, equal access to divorce, um, an absence of a premarital sex double standard uh, that men resolve disputes in peaceful ways and interventions in family violence if it occurs are immediate. And, and so um, uh, there certainly uh, are some um, interesting features there. And then uh, Urchak and Rosenfeld uh, extended Levinson's model and found that the habitual use of physical force uh, and frequent engagement in external warfare and a previous uh, warrior ideology increased the likelihood of um, uh, wife beating and other family uh, violence. And, and so again, here what we want to do is, is begin to ask ourselves, is it possible that um, this whole idea of uh, cultural spillover and strain and this ecological model kind of combining, uh, if, if, if we were to uh, take a look and wondering, uh, does this help us in um, you know, addressing how um, societies may become uh, genocid genocidal? And, and so there's still a lot more uh, work, as, as you can see. And one of the things I'd mention is, is your textbook provides a wealth of information, but it is not a um, theoretic, criminal justice theoretical uh, text applied to genocide. No, basically it provides an excellent examination in history of, of genocide, looking at um, you know, the uh, process of how genocide occurred and um, allowing us comparative analysis. Uh, but still, um, I, I would I would say that um, we don't have a lot of theoretical research on on genocide in the criminal justice field. It's um, uh, very uh, ripe for um, uh, research. Uh, I can tell you that even though I'm in a position where I don't have to publish uh, for my um, uh, you know for promotion or for my employment, I'm not I'm, I'm not on a tenure track uh, position. And um, and so publishing articles and journals is not part of my particular role. It's primarily teaching. But I do publish and specifically on genocide and developing theories of, of, of genocide. And what I wanted to mention is that I have found that I um, was able to publish several articles fairly rapidly. And, and I think primarily that's because there's very little in, in this area. And um, very few criminal justice uh, professionals doing research in, um, in, in, in genocide. So, so you can see that compared to your other classes, probably uh, there's a lot, uh, a longer bridge to cross bringing theory into uh, genocide studies and a lot more questions we'd have to answer and a lot more uncertainty. And um, I, I, want, I wanted to point that out. Uh, I, I, we're really in the beginning. In, in the infancy stage of uh, criminal justice theoretical developments in, in, in genocide uh, uh, research. And, and so um, uh, I point out these general theories uh, in, 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 in this set of um, presentations and later on in the semester we'll look at some more specific theories applied uh, to genocide as well. Thank you.